Chapter Nine of Best Russian Short Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algy Pug. Best Russian Short Stories, edited and compiled by Thomas Seltzer. The Shades, a Fantasy, by Vladimir G. Korolenko. Part One. One. A month and two days had elapsed since the judges, amid the loud acclaim of the Athenian people, had pronounced the death sentence against the philosopher Socrates, because he had sought to destroy faith in the gods. What the gadfly is to the horse, Socrates was to Athens. The gadfly stings the horse in order to prevent it from dozing off, and to keep it moving briskly on its course. The philosopher said to the people of Athens, I am your gadfly. My sting pricks your conscience and arouses you when you are caught napping. Sleep not, sleep not, people of Athens. Awake and seek the truth. The people arose in their exasperation and cruelly demanded to be rid of their gadfly. Perchance both of his accusers, Miletus and Antius, are wrong said the citizens, on leaving the court after sentence had been pronounced. But after all, whither do his doctrines tend? What would he do? He has wrought confusion. He overthrows beliefs that have existed since the beginning. He speaks of new virtues which must be recognized and sought for. He speaks of a divinity hitherto unknown to us. The blasphemer! He deems himself wiser than the gods. No! were better we remain true to the old gods whom we know. They may not always be just. Sometimes they may flare up in unjust wrath, and they may also be seized with a wanton lust for the wives of mortals. But did not our ancestors live with them in the peace of their souls? Did not our forefathers accomplish their heroic deeds with the help of these very gods? And now the faces of these Olympians have paled, and the old virtue is out of joint. Where does it all lead to? Should not an end be put to this impious wisdom once for all? Thus the citizens of Athens spoke to one another as they left the place, and the blue twilight was falling. They had determined to kill the restless gadfly in the hope that the countenances of the gods would shine again. And yet, before their souls arose the mild figure of the singular philosopher, there were some citizens who recalled how courageously he had shared their troubles and dangers at Potidae, how he alone had prevented them from committing the sin of unjustly executing the generals after the victory over the Arginusae, how he alone had dared to raise his voice against the tyrants who had had fifteen hundred people put to death, speaking to the people on the marketplace concerning shepherds and their sheep. Is he not a good shepherd? he asked who guards his flock and watches over its increase or is it the work of the good shepherd to reduce the number of his sheep and disperse them and of the good ruler to do the same with his people men of athens let us investigate this question and at this question of the solitary undefended philosopher the faces of the tyrants paled while the eyes of the youths kindled with the fire of just wrath and indignation. Thus, when on dispersing after the sentence the Athenians recalled all these things of Socrates, their hearts were oppressed with heavy doubt. Have we not done a cruel wrong to the son of Sophroniscus? But then the good Athenians looked upon the harbour and the sea, and in the red glow of the dying day they saw the purple sails of the sharp-keeled ship sent to the Delian festival, shimmering in the distance on the blue Pontus. The ship would not return until the expiration of a month, and the Athenians recollected that during this time no blood might be shed in Athens, whether the blood of the innocent or the guilty. A month, moreover, has many days and still more hours. Supposing the son of Sophroniscus had been unjustly condemned, who would hinder his escaping from the prison, especially since he had numerous friends to help him? Was it so difficult for the rich Plato, for Aeschines and others, to bribe the guards? Then the restless gadfly would flee from Athens to the barbarians in Thessaly, or to the Peloponnesus, 
or, still farther, to Egypt. Athens would no longer hear his blasphemous speeches, his death would not weigh upon the conscience of the worthy citizens, and so everything would end for the best of all. Thus said many to themselves that evening, while aloud they praised the wisdom of the Demos and the Heliasts. In secret, however, they cherished the hope that the restless philosopher would leave Athens, fly from the hemlock to the barbarians, and so free the Athenians of his troublesome presence, and of the pangs of consciences that smote them for inflicting death upon an innocent man. Two and thirty times since that evening had the sun risen from the ocean, and dipped down into it again. The ship had returned from Delos, and lay in the harbour with sadly dripping sails, as if ashamed of its native city. The moon did not shine in the heavens, the sea heaved under a heavy fog, and, on the hill, lights peered through the obscurity like the eyes of men gripped by a sense of guilt. The stubborn Socrates did not spare the conscience of the good Athenians. We part, you go home, and I go to death, he said to the judges after the sentence had been pronounced. I know not, my friends. Which of us chooses the better lot? As the time had approached for the return of the ship, many of the citizens had begun to feel uneasy. Must that obstinate fellow really die? And they began to appeal to the consciences of Eschines, Phaedo, and other pupils of Socrates, trying to urge them on to further efforts for their master. Will you permit your teacher to die? they asked reproachfully in biting tones. Or do you grudge the few coins it would take to bribe the guard? In vain Crito besought Socrates to take to flight, and complained that the public was upbraiding his disciples with lack of friendship and with avarice. The self-willed philosopher refused to gratify his pupils, all the good people of Athens. Let us investigate, he said. If it turns out that I must flee, I will flee, but if I must die... I will die. Let us remember what we once said. The wise man need not fear death. He need fear nothing but falsehood. Is it right to abide by the laws we ourselves have made, so long as they are agreeable to us, and refuse to obey those which are disagreeable? If my memory does not deceive me, I believe we once spoke of these things, did we not? Yes, we did, answered his pupil. And I think all were agreed as to the answer? Yes. But perhaps what is true for others is not true for us? No, truth is alike for all, including ourselves. But perhaps when we must die, and not someone else, truth becomes untruth. No, Socrates, truth remains the truth under all circumstances. After his pupil had thus agreed to each premise of Socrates in turn, he smiled and drew his conclusion. If that is so, my friend, mustn't I die? Or has my head already become so weak that I am no longer in a condition to draw a logical conclusion? Then correct me, my friend, and show my erring brain the right way. His pupil covered his face with his mantle and turned aside. Yes, he said, now I see you must die. And on that evening, when the sea tossed hither and thither, and roared dully under the load of fog, and the whimsical winds in mournful astonishment gently stirred the sails of the ships, when the citizens meeting on the streets asked one another, Is he dead? and their voices timidly betrayed the hope that he was not dead. When the first breath of awakened conscience touched the hearts of the Athenians, like the first messenger of the storm, and when, it seemed, the very faces of the gods were darkened with shame, on that evening at the sinking of the sun, the self-willed man drank the cup of death. The wind increased in violence and shrouded the city more closely in the veil of mist, angrily tugging at the sails of the vessels delayed in the harbour. And the Arrhenias sang their gloomy songs to the hearts of the citizens, and whipped up in their breasts that tempest which was later to overwhelm the denouncers of Socrates. But in that hour the first stirrings of regret were still uncertain and confused. 
the citizens found more fault with Socrates than ever, because he had not given them the satisfaction of fleeing to Thessaly. They were annoyed with his pupils, because in the last days they had walked about in sombre mourning attire, a living reproach to the Athenians. They were vexed with the judges, because they had not had the sense and the courage to resist the blind rage of the excited people. They bore even the gods' resentment. To you, ye gods, have we brought this sacrifice? spoke many. Rejoice, ye unsatiable. I know not which of us chooses the better lot. Those words of Socrates came back to their memory, those his last words to the judges and to the people gathered in the court. Now he lay in prison, quiet and motionless under his cloak, while over the city hovered mourning, horror and shame. Again he became the tormentor of the city, he who was himself no longer accessible to torment. The gadfly had been killed, but it stung the people more sharply than ever. Sleep not, sleep not this night, O men of Athens, sleep not. You have committed an injustice, a cruel injustice, which can never be erased. 2. During those sad days, Xenophon the general, a pupil of Socrates, was marching with his ten thousand in a distant land, amid dangers, seeking a way of return to his beloved fatherland. Eschines, Crito, Critobulus, Phaedo, and Apollodorus were now occupied with the preparations for the modest funeral. Plato was burning his lamp and bending over a parchment. The best disciple of the philosopher was busy inscribing the deeds, words, and teachings that marked the end of the sage's life. A thought is never lost, and the truth discovered by a great intellect illumines the way for future generations like a torch in the dark. There was one other disciple of Socrates. Not long before, the impetuous Ctesippus had been one of the most frivolous and pleasure-seeking of the Athenian youths. He had set up beauty as his sole god, and had bowed before Clinius as its highest exemplar. But since he had become acquainted with Socrates, all desire for pleasure and all light-mindedness had gone from him. He looked on indifferently while others took his place with Clinius. The grace of thought and the harmony of spirit that he found in Socrates seemed a hundred times more attractive than the graceful form and the harmonious features of Clinius. With all the intensity of his stormy temperament, he hung on the man who had disturbed the serenity of his virginal soul, which for the first time opened to doubts as the bud of a young oak opens to the fresh winds of spring. Now that the master was dead, he could find peace neither at his own hearth, nor in the oppressive stillness of the streets, nor among his friends and fellow disciples. The gods of hearth and home, and the gods of the people, inspired him with repugnance. I know not, he said, whether you are the best of all the gods, to whom numerous generations have bared incense and brought offerings. All I know is that for your sake the blind mob extinguished the clear torch of truth, and for your sake sacrificed the greatest and best of mortals. It almost seemed to Ctesippus, as though the streets and marketplaces still echoed with the shrieking of that unjust sentence, and he remembered how it was here that the people clamoured for the execution of the generals who had led them to victory against the Arjunice, and how Socrates alone had opposed the savage sentence of the judges and the blind rage of the mob. But when Socrates himself needed a champion, no one had been found to defend him with equal strength. Ctesippus blamed himself and his friends, and for that reason he wanted to avoid everybody, even himself, if possible. That evening he went to the sea, but his grief grew only the more violent. It seemed to him that the mourning daughters of Nereus were tossing hither and thither on the shore, bewailing the death of the best of the Athenians and the folly of the frenzied city. The waves broke on the rocky coast with a growl of lament. Their booming sounded like a funeral dirge. He turned away, left the shore, and went on further without looking before him. He forgot time and space and his own ego, filled only with the afflicting thought of Socrates. Yesterday he still was. Yesterday his mild words could still be heard. How is it possible that today he no longer is? O night! O giant mountain shrouded in mist, 
O heaving sea, moved by your own life, O restless winds that carry the breath of an immeasurable world on your wings, O starry vault flecked with flying clouds, take me to you, disclose to me the mystery of this death, if it is revealed to you. And if ye know not, then grant my ignorant soul your own lofty indifference. Remove from me these torturing questions. I no longer have the strength to carry them in my bosom without an answer, without even the hope of an answer. For who shall answer them, now that the lips of Socrates are sealed in eternal silence, and eternal darkness is laid upon his lids? Thus Stesippus cried out to the sea and the mountains, and to the dark night, which followed its invariable course, ceaselessly, invisibly, over the slumbering world. Many hours passed before Stesippus glanced up and saw whither his steps had unconsciously led him. A dark horror seized his soul as he looked about him. 3. It seemed as if the unknown gods of eternal night had heard his impious prayer. Stesippus looked about, without being able to recognize the place where he was. The lights of the city had long been extinguished by the darkness. The roaring of the sea had died away in the distance. His anxious soul had even lost the recollection of having heard it. No single sound, no mournful cry of nocturnal bird, nor whirr of wings, nor rustling of trees, nor murmur of a merry stream, broke the deep silence. Only the blind will-o'-the-wisps flickered here and there over rocks, and sheet lightning, unaccompanied by any sound, flared up and died down against crag peaks. This brief illumination merely emphasized the darkness, and the dead light disclosed the outlines of dead deserts crossed by gorges like crawling serpents, and rising into rocky heights in a wild chaos. All the joyous gods that haunt green groves, purling brooks, and mountain valleys seemed to have fled for ever from these deserts. Pan alone, the great and mysterious Pan, was hiding somewhere nearby in the chaos of nature, and with mocking glance seemed to be pursuing the tiny ant that a short time before had blasphemously asked to know the secret of the world and of death. Dark, senseless horror overwhelmed the soul of Stesippus. It is thus that the sea, in stormy flood tide, overwhelms a rock on the shore. Was it a dream? Was it reality? Or was it the revelation of the unknown divinity? Stesippus felt that in an instant he would step across the threshold of life, and that his soul would melt into an ocean of unending, inconceivable horror, like a drop of rain in the waves of the grey sea on a dark and stormy night. But at this moment he suddenly heard voices that seemed familiar to him, and in the glare of the sheet lightning his eyes recognised human figures. End of the Shades A Fantasy by Vladimir G. Korolenko Part 1 Recording by Algy Pug, Perth, Western Australia